Good morning, I'm Victoria Kepnick and I'm uh, just going to do a quick introduction to SanDisk, um, who we are, uh, because, let's see, so first of all, forward-looking statements, because we're a public company, I have to put these up here. It just means that anything you hear today, you shouldn't use it to base decisions on stock purchases or sales. Um, and then that's me, there I am, I'm a product marketing person here at SanDisk. Um, I know you don't want to hear the marketing story, so we're gonna <laughs> I won't be long. But um, I know there are some of you that are quite familiar with SanDisk and who we are, what we make, um, the different products we offer. But most people know SanDisk for essentially this, our camera cards. We go to trade shows and everybody is like, it's VMworld, we go to VMworld and everybody says, SanDisk, are you guys giving away camera cards? What are you guys doing here at VMworld? And so everyone knows us for these beautiful photos because professional photographers use our camera cards because they are some of the best performing, most reliable memory cards in the industry. So photographers that of course work for magazines that you've all heard of in the sports world or just you know capturing images of you know wildlife and different cultures and people um, so those kinds of photographers use SanDisk memory cards. But we're way more than camera cards even though they use us uh, because we're a very trusted device for them and they don't have a second chance to get the shot. It's, you know, one time or nothing. Um, but we're also a global inner innovator and what most people don't realize is that um, we are a pioneer in flash memory. We've been doing flash memory for over 25 years. And um, one of the other key things is we have the fourth most powerful patent portfolio in the industry. And even though we're the fourth most powerful patent portfolio, we're also like, um, I don't know how we rank in terms of the largest patent portfolio, but we are the only company whose patent for portfolio, portfolio is almost exclusive exclusively um, focused on flash technology. So we have more patents around flash technology than any other vendor. Um, so with that, what are we doing in the enterprise? What do camera cards and SanDisk have to do with enterprise storage and big data storage? So we're taking a lot of that intellectual property and that knowledge and that know-how and the trust and respect, um, the reliability that we've built up on more of the consumer and retail side of the business uh, with those professional photographers and focusing that now into the data center space. And so the infinity a flash system that we're going to dive into this morning um, really is the culmination of SanDisk's efforts and a lot of the strengths that SanDisk brings to the table um, are culminating in the InfiniFlash product line. And so I've actually brought um, three of our engineering fellows this morning to really get into the details of InfiniFlash and talk to you about what that's all about, how we um, determined, you know, what we would architect into it, <laughs> and um, then the use cases for where we see this going in the world of big data and how it's going to begin to change big data. So with that, I will turn it over to Alan Samuels. Um, he's the first gentleman, one of our engineering fellows, that's uh, going to speak to you. So just a quick outline of what the three of us are going to talk about. I'm going to talk about you know, the juxtaposition of flash and big data, which is uh, a new term and a rare thing. Why would you do that? Um, then uh, the next gentleman, Fritz, uh, he's going to talk about uh, why we are rethinking the way that products are delivered in the data center. We think that uh, Pretty, pretty exciting offerings into the future. And then the last gentleman, Rourke, is going to talk about the use cases and some of the economics underlying what we think is an important trend. So the why do we, you know, why are we talking about big data uh, um, here at SanDisk? Because we think that the era of hard drives and big data is basically coming to an end. Okay, and what I mean by that is that the processing power or the 
processing of big data is really driven by the bandwidth in and out of the storage. I mean, obviously, there are lots of big data jobs that are compute bound, etc. And uh, but uh, you know the next and, and there are networking bound issues too. But storage bandwidth is a major uh, component of that. And uh, getting and sustaining high bandwidth out of hard drives is really very difficult and it's increasingly difficult going into the future. There's a whole list of reasons for why that is and uh, I think uh, you know, Rourke uh, can speak to some of those uh, uh, in more detail. But you know, when you start looking into the future, what you have to realize is that the bandwidth going out of a hard drive is roughly constant. It's limited by the physics of the hard drive and the single head, the electronics to read data off of that. When you lay that up against the other trends in the industry, CPU power, you know, in the form of increasing core counts is continuing to expand exponentially into the future. What that means is that your uh, ratio between the you know, hard drives and your cores is having to increase about two to three X every generation just to hold, just to stand still. Okay, so if you follow that trend and you do in fact double the number of hard drives per CPU core, or turn it around and cut the number of CPU cores, excuse me, you know, chips in half, um, what you end up with is a system that's no longer cheaper, faster, or smaller. It just stores more data. Essentially, your cost per transaction no longer declines going into the future. We don't think that's a future very many people will find interesting. Mm -hmm. So it shouldn't surprise you we think Flash is the answer to that problem. Um, the important thing to realize is that the, you know, the bandwidth you get out of a Flash subsystem isn't really constrained by the physics the way it is in a hard drive. It's really constrained by the economics. And that's a choice that we make. Okay? You know, the economics of semiconductor packaging, the economics of wiring on PCBs, um, economics of wiring and cables, those are the things that drive the kind of bandwidth that you get out of flash. I mean, we could make the chips much smaller with more pads on them if we wanted to. There's nothing physical to prevent that. You know, the, the, the current solutions are picked because they're believed to be the right economic point for delivering this stuff cost effectively. And what that means is, is that over time, the, you know, the price that you pay for bandwidth is going to continue to decline. You're going to see that continue to, you know, uh, it's been on an exponential uh, decline. That's clearly going to continue for many years into the future. We can all debate when you know, Moore's Law comes to an end. I'm hoping I'll be retired by then. But uh, it's certainly several years in the future. And what that means is if you build your system around Flash, your transactions per dollar cost will decline. As well as all the other benefits you get out of Flash of you know, great, greatly improved reliability and performance. The biggest objection to Flash is the cost, you know, and that's going to continue to decline. I think that uh, you know, we've made some uh, important uh, breakthroughs here at SanDisk on that vector, and it's not done by any stretch of the imagination. You know, the, con the conversion to 3D in the industry is ongoing. Um, you're going to continue to see exponential cost decreases in Flash as it follows the semiconductor curve. So the real question is, is you know, what's the best way to bring Flash cost-effectively into a big data environment? <laughs> so the first thing to realize is that in the, in the big data world, generally, caching of data is pretty much ineffective. You know, if you're processing a large data set, holding a small portion of that in the cache, the access patterns for that, particularly in the Hadoop and the MapReduce world, um, just simply aren't amenable to caching. You really have to think about the problem as, I need to put my entire data set on Flash, because if any portion of it isn't there, it's going to get constrained by that. And that's basically what Almdahl's law tells you, is that you know, the, as you shrink a portion of the computation, the parallel portion of that, it, you know, the sequential portion dominates. And 
it's essentially the same story. If you put some of it on HDD, then the HDD is what lags everything down or uh, retards that, and you're basically back to being limited by the speed of that. You know, there's an awful lot of industry practices that have been built up over time that are really an outgrowth of the fundamental physics associated with hard drives. You know, they're mechanical entities, they have a certain failure rate, um, you know, the, all of the sort of consequences of that. Uh, you need to go back and re-examine those in the world of Flash and we think that a number of the sort of the standard best practices that you, we've built up around HDDs no longer makes sense in the flash world. In particular, if you're looking at data availability, for example, you know, data protection, you know, pure replication really isn't the best cost-effective way to get there. Okay, you know, there's a lot of things that have changed around that. The price of CPU has come down, uh, price of networking has come down, the ability to do erasure coding at the rack level is quite affordable now, whereas it really wasn't, say, 10 years ago. And, of course, the, you know, what's underlying that is the failure rate for an all-solid-state device is you know, an order of magnitude less than it is for even the most reliable of hard drives. Never mind the cheaper hard drives. Uh, and uh, if you follow the old practices of replication of the data, you're just basically uh, creating a Cadillac data protection environment. You know, you're going to end up with you know way more reliability there uh, that's not going to be present at the system level because it's not going to match the reliability of other parts of your system. You know, power supplies and CPUs and the networking components, etc. So, um, and again, Rourke is going to talk on this in some more detail. We, you know, we look at uh, this and it suggests that erasure coding with coding rates of 20%, so that I mean you're at 1.2x or 1.25x the amount of data that you're storing, provides a mean time to data loss that's better than what you get with triple replication on hard drives. Okay. So one of the big components of the way the economics is attacked is by changing the way that we protect the data when we store it to play with the, uh, you know, with the, you know, rowing with the stream of semiconductors versus mechanical, electromechanical devices. What kind of durability are you getting with only 20% overhead? I mean, I've seen 1.4 and 1.5x, but 1.2 is pretty, it's like, that's not a lot of overhead at all. Correct. Yeah, how, what sort of durability are we talking there? Is it like, is that comparable to hard disk drives? Is it we think that's, two, three times uh, better? Uh, or? Fritz has gone through the numbers for that, but I think that's still a little bit better than our triple replication with hard drives, not dramatically better. Yeah, okay. you know, obviously, if your coding is 1.4, 1.5, you're probably significantly exceeding mm. the durability that you're getting on hard drives. Yeah, okay. 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 The other thing, of course, that's important here is is the durability now is a variable you can set. Okay, and you know it, it's a it's now a floating point number really instead of an integer. Mm. Okay, you know because with replication you you're you know double or triple that's pretty large uh, increments in cost. Whereas with the erasure coding, you know, gee, we can have an argument about 1.2 versus 1.25, yeah. for example. But, okay. yeah, but when you say you, you mean the manufacturer of whoever's doing the, ra the erasure coding, because don't you have to change which algorithm you use? Like, it's not a user tunable where you could say, yeah, this data only needs to be protected with this much durability compared to that stuff. I think it's moving to the user settable world. So in the you know, classic enterprise storage systems, the data protection, you know, it, that's part of what you're buying. Okay. I think when you look into the big data world, uh, you're going to see the protection moving up into the application layer more or what's called software defined storage and the code bases for those are moving to an environment where users are going to be able to dial in what they want for different pools of data. And then I believe that's the world that, that we're going to see.
So even with that said, storing every last bit of your data on Flash, which would, you know, as a SanDisk shareholder, I'd love that idea. Okay, just you know, still you know, economically doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, an awful lot of uh, access patterns are amenable to tiering. You know, it, tiering works for most people. There are certainly a few places where it doesn't work, but uh, most people's applications or environments have uh, hot data and infrequently used uh, uh, colder data sets. They want to retain them. Uh, end of the month processing, you know, once a week processing, things like that. Uh, those are all work very well on tiering. Um, and uh, you know, creating an, uh, a sort of hybrid storage environment where you have a primary tier of flash using the say 1.2, 1.25, pick, pick your number of data integrity, okay, with a lower tier of uh, capacity optimized hard drives we think is really uh, a sweet spot for a pretty large portion of the market, okay, and uh, you know uh, I'll get into that a little more in a second, but it really sort of the best of both worlds. You've got your primary tier, which is performance optimized, and you use the best performance technology available, which is you know, clearly flash. And uh, your second tier is capacity optimized. It turns out that uh, um, it really utilizes both tiers to their uh, maximum economic potential. And, what, and one of the reasons for that is the one of the largest problems of getting bandwidth out of the hard drives is sort of the crosstalk problem, which is you know you, you're servicing multiple usages of the data simultaneously it means you're constantly moving the head. That's what ends up killing the performance. So in a tiering model, the most of the crosstalk is absorbed in the primary tier, and the only thing the second tier, secondary tier ever really does is move data to and from the primary tier in the background. And that's kind of the optimal environment for the hard drive. You sort of legislated pretty much all of the crosstalk out of existence. Okay, so you really can run those secondary tier drives in a full streaming mode and, and, and really get their maximum bandwidth. So, you know, how do I build this primary tier in the big data world? You know, that's uh, something that the industry is in the middle of grappling with right now. You know, there are several ways to uh, provide data in the, in the big data world. Um, you're seeing, you know, in the HDFS world, um, HDFS is walking there. Okay, there are pieces of the, the tiering is already built into HDFS in terms of the mechanism to move data back and forth. It doesn't have a policy yet, policy engine, that'll allow you to sort of autonomically move the data around, but you know, work on that is ongoing. I expect we're gonna see that in that world fairly soon now. Um, the underlying erasure coding uh, is not built into the Apache release yet. But Facebook has released a, a module that does that. Uh, you can add that on yourself if you're so inclined. Uh, that's open source, it's out there. Um, they had a number of papers on how well it works for them. Um, I think you're gonna see that functionality move into the standard implementations for, out of the Apache project here in the near future. I think there's a number of Jira's around that that are being you know, worked away at. Uh, there are a couple other interesting platforms. The Ceph open source platform um, on the object side uh, already does erasure coding today. It's built in and it's released. You can run uh, Hadoop or MapR directly on top of the object interface to S3. I th we think that's an interesting uh, configuration. I think our work's going to speak about that some more. This, you know, the, the, the OpenStack Swift project has been working eagerly on erasure coding, um, and they are scheduled to release that with the Kilo release, which I think will be announced next week uh, when, at the OpenStack Summit in Vancouver. Um, okay, and uh, Ceph also has a direct HDFS connector that runs on the file system variant to Ceph that has uh, uh, tiering built into its caching structure. Uh, I think I talked about some of these. You, the, there's been a lot of work going on with SMR drives. 
uh, you know, sort of not ready for prime time yet, mostly because of the upper tiers aren't really able to deal with the quirkiness of SMR drives. We think those are ideal for the second tier here. It has all the right characteristics of moving the largest blocks, uh, and uh, we think that the you know, additional coatings, uh, uh, aerial density increase from that is exactly the kind of thing that you want to see in the lower tier for these big data applications. The other thing is, is that uh, once you have the primary tier with a separate mean time to data loss, uh, you, you can uh, look at the other tiers uh, in a different way. Instead of saying all my data has to be triple replicated, um, not all data is of equal value. You can look at uh, perhaps only uh, duplicating the data on the lower tier for additional cost savings that might be appropriate for certain classes of data. The other thing that you can do, because the tiering is a background activity, you can physically locate one of those replicas uh, at a geographic distance and now you've essentially got built-in DR for nothing more than the networking costs. You don't need a separate copy at distance in order to provide uh, uh, data protection geographically. We're talking a lot about HDFS. Mm -hmm. Are we, are we, is HDFS good enough? Are we done? Are we, is H, are we there with HDFS? Well, you know, HDFS is sort of purpose built for a class of applications, okay? You know, and it works well enough for that. I, you know, you're seeing some tuning. Um, you know, I think the, in terms of where it, the, you know, the, the center of the design space that it was architected for, you're, I think, starting to approach sort of diminishing returns and the improvement in there. The other vector that's going on is people are trying to stretch the bounds of where it's applicable. And I think that's going to be more problematic. You know, okay, the, the architecture of a essentially centralized name node, even with redundancy, et cetera, that scaling that's going to be hard in that environment. I'm not saying it can't be done. I don't, I'm not sure the economic value of scaling that is going to justify the level of investment that it required to go fix that problem. Okay. 